Listen, we've been doing this longevity thing for quite a while. And during that while, we've covered what feels like all of the underlying cellular and metabolic drivers of aging. Things like oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA damage, cellular senescence, chronic inflammation, insulin resistance, gut dysbiosis, endothelial dysfunction, and many others. But we never covered the single compound which seems to be connected to all of these not cool for biological school happenings. A compound which starts out being super abundant throughout our body's many systems in youth and suspiciously declines as we accumulate chronological years on this beautiful floating rock. Must be a coincidence, right? We'll uh, see about that. As we explore the longevity connections of the tripeptide, you're gonna wanna know about glutathione. Let's go. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are once again on the topic of longevity modulators, but unlike all the other times we've explored these cellular vibe boosters, this is not a cellular component pathway or mechanism. Instead, it acts as a modulator and mediator of cellular function, which I gotta tell you has some pretty impressive full body reach. And we'll be reviewing a new human randomized control trial, which does not disappoint in displaying its impact. More specifically, what supplementing this compound back into the biological equation may be able to do. A topic which we'll of course dive deeper into during the, so how exactly does this apply to my life section at the end. But first, before we get there, I gotta first tell you why you should even care about this master longevity modulator. Because I gotta tell you, I learned a lot of eye-opening things myself during this research endeavor, which is the best part of the job, at least in my opinion. So here's why you should care. And it starts with understanding that glutathione is actually a tripeptide or a compound comprised of three non-essential amino acids, glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. And when bonded, this amino acid powerhouse has some, well, powerful biological pull including being one of our most relied upon antioxidants or scavenger of damaged reactive oxygen species and free radicals, preventing oxidative damage to cellular components like DNA, proteins, and lipids, which as we know, accelerate the aging process, while also recycling other antioxidants like vitamin E and vitamin C back to their active forms after they've neutralized free radicals themselves. So that alone makes it pretty damn important for our longevity ambitions. But that's only the beginning. Next, we have its detoxification role. As glutathione binds to various toxins, including heavy metals, drugs, and pollutants, making them water soluble for easier excretion from the body, while also being a critical compound for our master detoxification organ, the liver. A uh, another important thing. So two for two. And if you think there's more, you wouldn't be wrong. Next, we move to our internal army within, the immune system. Here, glutathione modulates the production and differentiation of lymphocytes, enhances the activity of natural killer cells, and influences cytokine production, all of which are vital for optimal immune function. Oh, and it does all this by reducing overall inflammation via its aforementioned reactive oxygen species and free radical neutralizing capabilities. And knowing what we know about chronic inflammation, you know, being tied to basically every chronic condition and disease state that there is, this quite possibly could be glutathione's biggest longevity attribute. Or maybe it's the role that it has in supporting cellular proliferation and repair. Cause you know, cells get damaged like every second. And the ability to repair or remove that damage is something that we are great at when we're young and tend to only get less great at as time goes on. Here, glutathione is involved in maintaining the integrity of DNA by providing the environment necessary for DNA repair enzymes, which helps cancel out another hallmark of aging, DNA damage. Just like 
protein misfolding. Which, surprisingly not surprising, glutathione also plays a role in preventing. And at this rate, I bet you wouldn't even blink twice if I told you. It also happens to be highly concentrated in the mitochondria, promoting the organelle's health by neutralizing free radical leak before it can propagate elsewhere. While, in its spare time, nonchalantly, having neuroprotective and neurotransmitter supporting properties, and eye and skin health boosting and blood flow enhancing effect. So, uh, I hope after that quick fire hose of information, its longevity story begins to make sense. And at this point, you may be wondering, all right, all of this is awesome, but where's it go wrong? When's it turn bad? There's got to be a bad part, right? Well, I wish I could say you were wrong. Because unfortunately, there is a bad part. It's the fact that our natural levels of glutathione generally decrease with age across various key tissue types. In particular, the liver, brain, and in the blood, making it a potential suspect in the associated uptick in oxidative stress and inflammation we often see with aging. Two happenings which increase our odds, likelihood, and probability of dysfunction and disease, and thus are inversely correlated with longevity. Now, as you can imagine, this is a classic chicken and egg scenario because we are not too sure why these levels begin to decrease. However, there are some theories, including reduced glutathione synthesis due to the lower availability or activity of the enzymes required for its production, increased glutathione utilization as living and aging itself may increase the demand for glutathione due to higher levels of oxidative stress leading to its depletion. Then there's impaired glutathione recycling leading to less overall circulation of the compound and even a steel effect theory where impaired mitochondria and cells in non-brain organs steal glucose intended for the brain due to depleted glutathione levels and as a byproduct begin to impair the function of the brain's neurons. Not counting out of course that it could be a combination of all of these or something totally different. Which brings us to the thought provoking question of this powwow. What happens if we increase glutathione in older glutathione depleted people? A question which a group of researchers out of Baylor's College of Medicine sought to explore in this new randomized controlled trial. To do this, they had an intervention group of older and younger adults take a Glynax supplement, which is a mix of two glutathione precursors, glycine and N-acetylcysteine, for 24 weeks. Observing the effects on cognitive decline, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, insulin resistance, and endothelial dysfunction across both an intervention group, which got the Glynax, and a control group, which didn't. And as you can imagine, the older groups were worse off in basically all of these areas at the beginning of the study, with researchers calling out that they had a significant glutathione deficiency compared to the younger group. So what happened after the 24 weeks? Well, they observed that the supplementation improved or even corrected many of these defects, while also displaying improved cognitive function in the older intervention group. Hmm, you don't say. They even observed a reversal in that aforementioned brain glucose steel phenomena. Wow. But how do we know with a high level of confidence that it was, in fact, the Glynax supplementation driving this? Well, researchers then stopped the supplementation for 12 weeks to see what happened. And wouldn't you know it? It led to the redevelopment of the defects. Having researchers conclude, the findings from this trial provide proof of concept supporting Glynax supplementation in older adults to improve multiple mechanistic defects related to cognitive impairment and thereby also cognitive function and brain health. Now, I'd like to reiterate that 
POC terminology because more research is definitely needed to fully understand and prove out the mechanisms at play and see if they also translate to a larger sample size. That being said, this also brings up the question, is this something that we should be considering in our longevity supplement stack? Well, my answer to that is an astounding, definite possibility to a probable maybe. And here's why. It all comes down to our favorite word, context. Because all of our current state situations are different. And in my eyes, it starts with assessing if you actually even need a supplement. And since measuring glutathione throughout the body is quite the endeavor for the average longevity enthusiast, two assays that you can use to gauge this need is inflammation levels throughout the body and your diet. The former to see if you may be lacking or need more antioxidant support, and the latter to see if you are consuming adequate amounts of foods, which provide the building blocks for this tripeptide to be formed within your body. Step one of this would be to start tracking C-reactive protein with your blood work, ideally collecting it at least twice a year. This will give you an idea if you are experiencing elevated inflammation levels and indicate if you need to make some meaningful change. And you you want this metric to be consistently below 0.1 milligrams per liter. Now, if this number comes back elevated, that may mean some changes are worth exploring. The first of which I would always recommend starts with lifestyle. Because we know from all of our other powwows, the modern, western, ultra-processed, ultra-sedentary, nature-deprived, toxin-riddled, stress-abundant lifestyle many people live is a breeding ground for mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and chronic inflammation, along with basically all of the other hallmarks of cellular aging. So I'd advise you, very scientifically, I may add, to do the opposite. Cultivating an internal environment through lifestyle which promotes cellular function and efficiency. This right here will likely preserve your glutathione abundance much longer than the average Joe or Jane. And we have a ton of videos on this channel which talk about how to do just that. What I call own your health. So check out the show notes below for some links. Next, assess your diet because there are several foods already rich in glutathione, including asparagus, avocado, which also contains vitamin C, a nutrient that supports glutathione recycling, spinach, which contains both glutathione and its precursor cysteine, broccoli, kale, and Brussels sprouts, and garlic which contains a phytonutrient called allicin, linked to glutathione production. There are also many foods rich in glutathione's precursors, including cysteine-rich foods, such as whey protein, the yolks of eggs and red pepper, methionine-rich foods, which can be converted into cysteine, including fish like cod or salmon and Brazil nuts, which also come with selenium, a nutrient essential for glutathione peroxidase, or an enzyme that uses glutathione, and glycine-rich foods such as bone broth and gelatin. If your diet is abundant in real foods like the ones just listed, and you have consistently low C-reactive protein levels and otherwise pretty solid blood work, supplementation probably isn't necessary. However, if your diet is more along the lines of the normalized ultra-processed Western diet, then first, I'd suggest you begin to create a strategy to ditch it. Check out the How to Eat playlist for help doing that. And second, it may be worth considering a Glynax supplement or some combo glycine and acetylcysteine glutamine stack. Remember, this health and longevity thing is all about context with another big factor for consideration here being age. Because as we know, this compound begins to decrease in abundance as we accumulate chronological years on this beautiful floating rock. And as we also saw today, our cellular function tends to be in a better place when we have adequate levels. The big question, at least in my eyes, is if our lifestyle is solid and healthy, will it preserve our natural production, utilization, and recycling of this essential compound? A question, science, quite frankly, needs more time to hash out. But in the meantime, I think it's worth hedging your bets, taking a few minutes, putting pen to paper, fingers to keyboard to assess your current state situation, which is what owning your health is all about.
So start taking back control already.